Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Hardy Stradwatts in Sydney, where markets have just come online. And I'm Paul Allen. We are counting down to Asia's major trading opens. The top stories this hour. Asian stocks and bonds facing pressure after another week's sale of Treasuries drags down Wall Street. Yields rising as signs grow that the Fed is in no rush to cut rates. Salesforce plunging in late trade on its slowest ever growth forecast. C3 AI going the other direction in a sign of a shift towards software technologies. Plus BHP walking away from its bid for Anglo-American, leaving CEO Mike Henry to look elsewhere for growth in copper. On that note, we're obviously going to be taking a close look at uh, BHP shares when we do get trading underway here in Sydney in an hour's time. But ahead of that, uh, we've got futures looking a uh, little bit soft at the moment in negative territory to the tune of two thirds of one percent. Nikkei futures also looking fairly soft. We, we saw a pretty bad day for Aussie and uh, JGBs uh, yesterday, Aussie bonds as well, uh, after Australia's uh, April CPI beat. Uh, New Zealand going to be one to watch today. Uh, we've got the market currently trading softer by a half of one percent. It is budget day today. We'll talk more about that in a little bit while. Uh, New Zealand expected to announce some weaker revenue, higher borrowing and that return to surplus uh, very probably going to be pushed out till 2028 but we'll have all our answers uh, regards to the New Zealand budget in just under three hours time Heidi. I like the sound of that all of our answers and uh, look this is a market that's really searching for answers at the moment right particularly as to you know where the Fed will go next and perhaps unsurprising that we're getting a pretty weak lead through to the start of trading here in Asia it wasn't a great deal uh, of enthusiasm in the US session overnight S&P futures at this point continuing to look pretty sluggish three tenths of a percent lower. Tech is also seeing a further drag. It really was that slide in bonds uh, pulling stocks down with another week's sale of treasuries raising these concerns of the funding that the US deficit will drive yields up at a time when of course the Fed is in no rush it seems to cut rates at all. Uh, $44 billion sold in seven year notes at 4.65 that is above the pre-auction level but of course we had also two other offerings just a day ago that saw pretty lackluster demand as well. So these bond sales are seeing kind of growing influence, if you will, over other asset classes, including the sentiment when it comes to stock trading. Uh, watching crude as well, uh, Saudi Arabia set to launch that $10 billion Aramco share sale uh, as well on Sunday. We had, of course, some M&A action with ConocoPhillips to acquire Marathon Oil in that $17 billion deal. And of course, we are still weighing the impact of our geopolitical risk, Paul, and looking ahead to that OPEC Plus meeting. Well, let's get some market insight now with our first guest, uh, Belita Rong, is a chair at Dalton Investments. She joins us now. And uh, Belita, Heidi had mentioned in there uh, the beige book uh, that we got out of the U.S. a little bit earlier. It's not too bad. It's a slight modest expansion uh, for U.S. growth. And we saw consumer confidence rising in May. That was the first rise we saw there in four months. We've got yields rising, the Fed continuing to stress the need for patience. So do you think we're going to see another repricing on rate cut expectations at this rate? I think that the Fed's been pretty constant in its attitude about whether it will, uh, when and how uh, it will lower interest rates and the market's expectations have moved all over the place uh, as to the timing and um, the extent of rate cuts. Um, I think there's so much uncertainty because the Fed doesn't hasn't decided what it's going to do and when. And that's because uh, given the circumstances today, there's no reason to expect the Fed to cut rates. The economy is strong, inflation is not where they want it to be, and the sticky parts of inflation, which are um, in insurance premiums and rents, are likely not very sensitive to um, uh, rate cuts or rate increases. So I think for now, we just watch and see what the data brings. What do you anticipate around those sticky areas of inflation that you mentioned, particularly in services? Can that be brought under control uh, without inflicting too much pain on the economy? So frankly, I'm, um, I'm very uncertain about what the, the future will bring in terms of inflation and interest rates. Um, part of me has held the belief for a long time that regardless of what the Fed does on short rates, long rates will have a tough time coming down. And that's just because of the um, very expansionary fiscal policy of the Fed, not the Fed, sorry, the Treasury um, in the U.S. and other governments have conducted for many, many years, decades. At some point, the um, interest rates will reflect the borrowing that's taking place, uh, you know, en masse across the developed world. And perhaps we're beginning to see, see that. On top of that, within the U.S., you still have this huge problem of um, regional banks having... Um, 
mortgage uh, mortgages on their balance sheets that are problematic for them, that they cannot fund at a profit anymore. So they have to, at some point uh, in the future, if rates don't come down, consolidate and clean up their balance sheets because their business just isn't viable anymore. So that will cause all sorts of uh, demand for capital, which brings back this whole issue of where, who's going to lend and at what rates, uh, especially in the long end. So regardless of what the Fed does, I think the, the prospect for lower long rates um, is, is murky at best. Belita, is this an environment where international becomes even more interesting? If you take a look at Japan, for example, are there further legs ahead for this rally? We're still very optimistic about um, investment opportunities in Japan. So even after the rallies we've seen last year and this year, the Japanese market is very cheap. As an example, just a simple uh, benchmark to look at. If you look at EV over EBITDA, which is a much better benchmark to look at in Japan than PE because companies have so much cash on their balance sheets. You know, we, we see something like 40 plus percent of companies under $3 billion with EV EBITDA of under six. And private equity firms are doing uh, private equity deals at about between 15 times and 20 times uh, uh, earnings, um, or actually um, uh, EBITDA. So there's a huge gap between valuations in the Japanese market and what private equity is willing to pay for it. At the same time, you have this enormous pressure uh, from the Tokyo Stock Exchange, now as well from the FSA, to improve corporate governance uh, among corporate managements. And we're seeing a big change in uh, that whole place. And on top of that, even though we're seeing these changes that are very positive for stock valuations in Japan, you still have uh, most of global uh, the bulk of global um, uh, equity managers still underweight Japan. It's hard for me because we're so focused on Japan to understand why exactly, but perhaps it's because Japan's been such a bad place to invest for decades, probably for most of the careers of uh, professionals in the investment market. But for us, it is uh, one of the best places to invest currently. Would you also be, I guess, in a sense, front-loading when it comes to Korean assets because there is a sense that perhaps Korea can, in a lot of ways, replicate the success story that you know Japan has gotten to with this point, right? How do you position, given that that is sort of a longer-term story, if we go by how long it's taken Japan to get to this stage? It's taken Japan 10 years at this point since they started um, corporate governance reform and um, uh, encouraged shareholder activism. And with Korea, I think it will take a long time as well. The, the big problem in Korea is that of uh, taxes. Inheritance taxes are very high, which discourages um, uh, uh, these families who own these large conglomerates from having a high stock price because it just increases their tax burden when um, the uh, main shareholder pa passes away. So there needs to be some really pretty dramatic changes in Korea, which we believe have to come. Uh, but that just takes a long time. And with the recent uh, elections, it probably will take longer rather than less time. Nonetheless, we uh, see companies in Korea that are doing the right thing already. And so for stock pickers like us, there are very attractive opportunities in Korea. But for the market as a whole, I think we'll have to see um, several years of changes before it becomes a more attractive market for most people who want to just invest in Korea broadly. Uh, Belita, one market I know you're very bullish on, you're certainly not alone, and this is India. But do you feel that perhaps after the election, if the Modi government's returned uh, with a slightly weaker majority, uh, might you have to become a stock picker there as well, rather than taking just a broad-based approach? We are stock pickers in India, just like we are everywhere else. And in India, it's particularly important because of corruption. You have to really do your homework, know the companies, understand the families that uh, are sponsors of those companies and be sure they'll treat you fairly. So there's that hurdle to overcome in India, uh, which is uh, uh, critical. Um, so right now, for instance, the, um, uh, we're at an unusual point in time because a lot of the uh, domestic investors, domestic savers have these automatic savings accounts that increase monthly. And it went from nowhere, basically, to about $2 billion a month. And uh, the retail investors tend to be fairly indifferent to valuations. And so out of the blues, 
uh, small cap India has gotten more expensive than large cap. So we are uh, certainly taking profits where prices have risen, um, uh, we think, well above um, fair value and investing in companies which are out of favor for some reason or other. And right now they seem to be in the larger cap companies. So we definitely do um, you know, a lot of uh, portfolio uh, cleanup, uh, rebalancing uh, between companies when valuations move around, which they do in India. But as you say, we are bullish like a lot of people, and we remain bullish because the fundamental story in India is so strong. Belita, always great to chat with you. Belita Ong, Chairman at Dalton Investments. We are hearing at the moment from Sarah Hunter, who's the Assistant Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia. She's speaking this morning at the Australasian Investor Relations Association Annual Conference, really talking a little bit about yesterday's hotter than expected inflation numbers. Remember, inflation picking up for a second consecutive month here in Australia, really bolstering the case for the RBA to stay higher for longer and also reviving these uh, this chatter about potentially more tightening being needed. Sarah Hunter saying that she broadly agrees with the Treasury's inflation forecast uh, that when it comes to the CPI number that we got this week, it confirms the strength of a number of categories. Of course, we know that utilities, insurance, rents have been quite sticky. She says the RBA believes wages growth is at its uh, or near its peak, I should say. Some components of that uh, wage growth is beginning to see softness, that the RBA is being very watchful on both wages and productivity, really acknowledging the pressure that comes from the cost of living crisis, right? Sarah Hunter, uh, the assistant governor, saying that some Australian households are really struggling and there won't be, Paul, uh, an immediate turnaround in household spending. But on the corporate side, lending, uh, business investment, you know, as a key driver, obviously, of GDP growth has held up reasonably well so far. Yep. All right. Uh, we'll be taking a closer look at currencies later as well. Uh, we're watching the Aussie dollar there as uh, Sarah Hunter speaks and still to come. Uh, the yen's persistent weakness is going to be adding to expectations of a BOJ rate hike. National Australia Bank's going to join us to share their outlook for FX markets later. First, though, we'll take a look at what's next for BHP after walking away from its Anglo-American ambitions, ending what could have been the biggest mining de deal in a decade. I'm going to leave you now with some uh, live pictures from Iceland. Pictures of the moment there. That is the Reykjanes volcano currently erupting. Now, we've been watching this for a very long time. Uh, this is near the town of Grindavik, a coastal town of 3,800 people. It was largely evacuated back in December when uh, things started happening in a geological sense. Uh, so we've got lava now shooting 165 feet into the sky. That fissure that you're seeing there, two miles long. Uh, this is according to the Icelandic Meteorological Office. So live pictures there of the Reykjanes volcano in Iceland. More in a moment. This is Bloomberg. South Africa's most important election since the end of apartheid focuses on infrastructure challenges, economic growth, and political fragmentation. Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabasaja reports live from key battlegrounds in Johannesburg, Cape Town, and Durban. We think that South Africa is an exciting part of the world. South Africa is a thriving and vibrant democracy. There's a lot of expectation for the election. Continuing coverage today on Bloomberg Television. Context changes everything. Well, the biggest mining deal in what would have been over a decade is no more. In fact, uh, choosing to walk away, right, for BHP, I guess they'll be seeking for uh, copper opportunities elsewhere. But this sort of idea of having another extension that was uh, rebuffed, and I guess ultimately the sort of structural issues that they had with this deal uh, with Anglo-American just never got sorted. Yeah, and it ended as dramatically as it began. You know, an hour before the deadline, BHP's like, no more and uh, and walking away but uh, as you say would have been the biggest deal in a decade leaves anglo in an interesting position now too um but the ceo duncan wanbold uh, promised to deliver a turnaround plan well he's now going to have to make uh, good on that uh, but the complexity around this deal really seems to be what brought it undone right uh, bhp wanting to spin off those south african assets 
Anglo not so keen on that and the law says that well BHP can't have another stab now for six months unless there's a rival bid and well you wouldn't rule that out would you? Well you wonder if rivals are sort of breathing a sigh of relief or perhaps looking for uh, the opportunity there to, to, to perhaps hover around a little bit more because this would have created a commodities power powerhouse that would have towered over competitors and it still comes at a time well you know despite the sort of recent a little bit of a pullback and and uh, you know profit taking I would imagine when it comes to this copper rally it's up what about 25 percent almost this year that long-term bull case is structurally very much intact in terms of tighter supply greater demand even without the China recovery story uh, there's just so much demand for copper assets uh, and prices just continue to go in one direction so this kind of decision to walk away by BHB and Instead of sweetening or, or changing its bid, it, it's it's sort of a, a bit of a new reality, right? For deal making, they're coming back to uh, these discussions, but clearly boards are not wanting to anger shareholders by going too far. Yeah, well, there have been a few duds over the past mm. few years, so um, yeah, perhaps a little bit of uh, caution there. We did see Anglo shares fall on the uh, announcement of this. Uh, let's see how BHP does when we get going at the top of the hour. One of the stories we're watching uh, and some of the other headlines that we're tracking across the corporate space. Activist investor Nelson Peltz has reportedly sold his entire Disney stake. That's according to CNBC citing an unnamed source. Peltz's Try and Fund Management last month lost its bid to obtain Disney board seats. Try and Control Disney shares worth more than three and a half billion dollars. Sources say Saudi Arabia is set to launch a secondary offering of shares in oil giant Saudi Aramco that could raise over $10 billion. We're told the sale could happen as soon as Sunday, with informal interest already being expressed from investors across Middle East and Europe. Uh, proceeds will fund initiatives to diversify the Saudi economy away from oil. ConocoPhillips has agreed to acquire Marathon Oil in an all-stock deal valuing Marathon at about $17 billion. The move expands Conoco's footprint in U.S. shale and hands it reserves as far afield as Equatorial Guinea. It also extends a buying spree among major U.S. oil and gas players. ConocoPhillips shares fell. Marathon surged following the news. Bloomberg has learned that Sony Music is in talks to acquire Queen's music catalogue, which includes hits such as, of course, Bohemian Rhapsody. Sources say Sony is working with another investor on the purchase, which could total $1 billion. Earlier this year, Sony acquired a half interest in Michael Jackson's catalogue for at least $600 million. Coming up in the next hour of Daybreak, our exclusive interview with the CEO of Link Asset Management. This is uh, a group that manages Hong Kong's first listed real estate investment trust. We're talking about their business strategy after the portfolio reported an earnings missed. Much more to come though on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Tesla has been having a tough year. Layoffs have been mounting, its uh, stock has been cratering, and some investors say it's got a distracted leader in charge as Elon Musk manages five other firms. Today's Big Take takes a closer look at Musk's orbit and how his galaxy of companies stays afloat. The senior reporter Dana Hull joins us now from San Francisco. So how does this Elon Musk uh, workflow, organizational chart, uh, differ from well, what we might consider normal? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that a typical company would have an, a clear organizational chart that would be on its website. Tesla and all the other companies don't have that. So what we created was sort of a more fluid, ever-shifting, ever-shaping solar system, um, you know, with Elon as the sun, obviously. And I think it gives people like a better representation of just how... Musk operates and how his companies all kind of overlap and interact with each other. I mean, there are many people who kind of play multiple roles, wear multiple hats. Um, the same characters show up over and over again in terms of investors and board members. And, um, you know, but this is by no means definitive, but it should give people a kind of a clear sense of who's surrounding Elon and, and all of the, in the constellation of the companies. 
Dan, you know, some of these sort of critiques of Elon Musk have been around for a while, that he's distracted, that he's got too much on his plate, and I'm sure a lot of his uh, sort of executive leadership would prefer him uh, to be more focused. What sort of inspired Bloomberg and you to, to take on this project? I, I'm, I'm very intrigued by this, uh, this graphic that we have on our screens. Sure. Well, part of it came about because um, Tesla is facing a very critical shareholder vote on June 13th, and they will be voting again on the pay package that shareholders first approved for Musk at Tesla in 2018. But between 2018 and now, Musk has, start, has, has two more companies. I mean, he bought Twitter, which he now calls X, and he started X.AI, a brand new AI company that he's raising billions of dollars for. So his, his, his influence and his empire continues to grow. I mean, the guy has a lot of ideas for companies. He used to run two, then it was four, now it's six. I mean, there doesn't seem to be an end to his appetite for startups and for um, doing a lot of things beyond Tesla. A Bloomberg senior reporter, Dana Hall, there. Uh, subscribers can read more on today's Big Take on the Terminal. It's a good one. NI Big Take is your function. It's also over at Bloomberg.com. Well, Hyundai's global COO is confident that the automakers bet on growing U.S. demand for electric vehicles while still investing in hybrids. We spoke exclusively with Jose Munoz, who also gave us an update on the progress of Hyundai's new Georgia EV plant. Well, um, we are still very confident, and I was uh, visiting our plant uh, in uh, Savannah last week, and I'm happy to report that we'll be able to produce uh, three months ahead of a schedule. So by October this year, we will start producing uh, our very popular Ionic uh, 5. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's great. We're very confident. And then, as I've said many times, uh, we continue to double down on our uh, bet for electrification. And we're happy to continue with that. To so your question about uh, the hybrid, we've also seen that the evolution of uh, EV sales in the industry may be not as fast as everybody expected or as the regulation uh, would expect. And then we have seen also that uh, a number of consumers are betting for uh, maybe alternative uh, fuel types uh, beyond uh, ICE, like hybrids and plug-in hybrids. And that's why we have decided that in our plant in Savannah, we're going to produce also hybrid uh, vehicles. This is going to uh, imply, of course, an increase uh, on investment, but we believe is uh, needed. Uh, and uh, we are uh, very happy to see the reaction of our dealers and our stakeholders as we have announced that. Is the Ionic 5, by the way, great to see you as well, Jose. The Ionic 5 N uh, hit the market, wowing a lot of people with the sort of ICE emulation um, and sporty performance. Is that thing sold out already? I mean, what, is, what are the orders looking like for that? <laughs> well, Ionic 5N is unbelievable. I, I think the few uh, journalists like you, Matt, know really what this car can do. It's more than 640 horsepower. He just made it uh, to the performance car of the year uh, in the World Car uh, uh, event that took place in New York in April. And this is uh, only after two years earlier, the Ionic uh, 5 became World Car of the Year, EV Car of the Year, and uh, Design EV Car of the Year. I think this is one of the few cars that could raise you in one of your motorcycles mm -hmm. and beat you. But mm -hmm. then uh, I'll leave it to an opportunity in the future. I, I look forward to it, Jose. Listen, the price tag uh, continues to get higher as these um, cars gain popularity with consumers. Obviously, the Ionic has done well. This one costs, I think, uh, north of $65,000. And the Genesis uh, product is doing so well that you're able to take more price there. Do you see that power increasing even as it's falling for your competitors? Well, uh, we really do see the power increasing. So we really believe uh, that the future is going to be electric. Uh, so it's not a matter of if, uh, but uh, when. If you go to Europe, I think there is about a 20% mix of EVs. You go to uh, other regions like China, it's about 30%. We are sta stable in the United States, about 8%. But in our case, we continue to do very well. Uh, this year to date, we have increased our sales of EVs by more than 50%. Uh, and last year, we doubled our sales of EVs.
Time for morning calls ahead of the Asia Trading Day. JP Morgan Chair and CEO Jamie Dimon says he expects problems to emerge in private credit, especially as retail clients gain access to the asset class. He warns the private credit industry has not yet been tested by bad markets, which could expose the weaknesses of new products. Stress tested. You know, I, I'm, do, do, do people really fully understand what I said about interest rates affecting what these things are worth? Do they? And, and if a little old lady finds out that she can't get her money back, and uh, there may have been disclosures, they're saying, you know, this money's locked up for five years. But you know what? <laughs> Retail clients tend to circle the block and call their senators and congressmen, and there could be hell to pay. Meanwhile, Morgan Stanley Investment Management is turning less bearish on Chinese stocks. Deputy CIO for Solutions and Multi-Asset Jatania Kandari says state support through share buybacks along with cheap valuations could help boost prices. But Kandari says they're still cautious as structural issues remain in the economy. Goldman Sachs sees the Bank of Japan approaching quantitative tightening with caution. Strategists say a full passive runoff by the BOJ would dwarf the pace of quantitative tightening of other major central banks. They estimate a steady unwinding could add up to 5 to 10 basis points on Japan's 10-year bond yields per year, with swap spreads tightening by a slightly smaller amount. All right, we are still getting uh, some of the commentary from the Assistant Governor of the RBA, Sarah Hunter, speaking in Sydney at a fireside chat this morning. She previously had been talking about, you know, the pressure on Australian households, how household spending is not really expected to bounce back very quickly. Uh, she's also talking a little bit now about the labour market seeing some signs of cooling down. She does expect that the labour market in Australia will continue to soften. Uh, the RBA is closely tra tracking some other elements, including the clean energy transition as well, and that impact on the economy. Uh, clearly she's been sort of thinking about the stagflation risks with the economy, saying that the RBA is always mindful uh, of these, very focused on CPI dynamics and the global backdrop. Of course this comes as a Fed is also looking to stay higher for longer and yesterday's CPI numbers are the second month of uh, acceleration for inflation pressures in Australia, certainly suggesting that the RBA uh, has plenty to contend with as it goes into its June meeting and potentially sort of higher for longer is the picture here as well. Uh, she did earlier also talk about kind of the struggle for a lot of households, um, the impact on wages and productivity with some components of wage growth starting to see some softening there as well. Take a look at how we're setting up uh, amidst all of this and it was a pretty weak lead when it comes to the equity session. Of course it was another session on Wall Street that was really dominated by the slide that we saw in bonds. Another weak auction uh, contributing to the earlier kind of lacklustre demand and a couple of sales that we saw earlier in the week and this is kind of starting to become uh, one of the dominant themes for other asset classes, not just across treasuries. But, uh, a little bit of weakness there, seven tenths of a percent low when it comes to trading in Sydney, futures, New Zealand. Um, as we take a look at the budget, we are seeing some weakness there uh, in cash trading as well. Singapore Nikkei futures looking like we'll see a bit of a drop for uh, the Nikkei and also the topics when we come online there as well. And that weakness being extended into trading uh, in S&P futures and NASDAQ futures there as well. Take a look at currencies and the dollar is now rising the most since April. More is about inflation, the global debt supply weighing on asset prices and of course uh, the commentary that continues to come through when it comes to staying higher for longer for the Fed. And all of this of course is weighing on Asian currencies in particular the yen. Let's bring in Ray Archer who was ahead of FX strategy at NAB and you know we were watching the level for the yen that previously uh, instigated suspected uh, intervention. 157, uh, 52 was where we're at. We actually went past that to 157.64. So is there a sense that there is a, a line in the sand? And actually our question of the day uh, is what happens if we go to 160 and past? Well, 160 is the level that where we saw suspected Bank mm. of Japan intervention. We should get confirmation of that uh, at the end of the month when um, the MOF publishes its, uh, its monthly balance sheet. Um, there's no doubt that the Bank of Japan was there and I think that the amount of intervention that they conducted there was pretty substantial, probably north of $50 billion. Um, I suspect that we're not too far off another foray, but we have to remember what's the underlying source of this latest uptrend. Look at 10-year US Treasury yields. We've risen about 30 basis points just in the last 10 days and that has been 
you know, the, the, the main driver of most of the dollar yen volatility that we've seen in the last couple of years, even though those JGB yields have poked their head above 1%, it's really the sort of absolute level of Treasury yields that seems to be dominating. So unless until we see some reversal there, um, or we see the Bank of Japan really stepping up, whether it's the pace of, of quantitative tightening, which you just mentioned, Paul, or whether we do see um, you know, rises in uh, the overnight rate that go beyond current market expectations, it's difficult to see you know, a near-term reversal of that trend. And I think the, the worry for broader Asia is that the dollar yen rate continues to rise. We've seen it in the PBOC's fixing mm. for the yuan, which I think was the weakest level since, what, January uh, 23rd yesterday. Um, and that's feeding back generally. It's undermined the Aussie dollar strength that we saw yesterday on the back of the CPI number. So the ripple effects from you know the yen continuing to weaken across Asia, I think, are pretty broad-based. The ripple effects from the yen continuing to weaken, the dollar continuing to strengthen, the Fed not being in a hurry mm -hmm. uh, where it is. I mean, it kind of goes to the broader concern of, I guess, a question of how how worried should broader Asia be with you know the the, the global impact of a Fed that is not going to move mm -hmm. sort of anywhere towards easing anytime soon. Well, I think I mean the implications of the Fed not easing are pretty profound, but mm -hmm. I think we should sort of take a little bit step back and, and remember that you know up until last week's that S&P that, uh, Global PMI and then early this week a strongly expected conference board reading, we'd had four or five weeks where US economic data had been consistently surprising to the downside and the clear signs of a shift in relative economic performance away from the US you know, in favour of the rest of the world, particularly in Europe. And we saw the dollar under substantial pressure and we saw hopes for Fed easing as early as Q3 really starting to ratchet higher. So it won't take much in terms terms of the incoming US economic calendar, if it sort of reverts back to saying, well, actually, the economy is cooling, actually, inflation is starting to moderate again, we can easily see that pendulum swing back. We'll start to see probably US Treasury yields easing back. And I think that will set off, you know, a, a renewed, modest, at least, dollar depreciation cycle. So at this stage, I haven't seen enough evidence from the US economic data to say that we should be calling time hmm. on any prospect of the Fed easing this year. Uh, aside from the US dollar, what about the yen versus some of the other currency pairs, uh, for example the euro, and if you see the ECB perhaps cutting in June, maybe even again in July, which we really can't rule out, uh, where do you see that pair heading? At, uh, well, at, uh, at the moment, we've still got a reasonably positive view of the euro. That June cut, as you say, is baked in the cake. I wouldn't be, at this stage, confident that we're going to see follow-up cuts. Our official view is that we'll see a cut in June and then September and then again at the end of the year. Um, you know, that's a little bit more than markets are currently thinking about at the moment. Um, so at the moment, it, if, if yen weakness continues to be dominated by, you know, ongoing rises in, in Treasury yields, you'd probably expect the euro-yen to continue... Uh, uh, rising in that environment, but I think it really is a case of you know where the dollar goes. Pretty much all currencies will go. So um, I don't have a you know a nailed on view that euro yen is destined for any strong moves one way or the other just at the moment. We've seen a few hints that the BOJ might be ready to tighten again. Um, would that have more impact than intervention? And do you think that narrative is believable? I think it is, yes. And I think we have seen a quite a significant shift in the narrative coming out of BOJ Governor Ueda. If you remember, out of the last BOJ meeting, was pretty adamant that, you know, yen weakness isn't having any detrimental effect as far as their inflation impact is concerned. Uh, that got quite a strong negative yen reaction. Fast forward to a week, and the narrative seems to have changed. We've heard from Deputy Governor Yoshida uh, at the beginning of this week or late last week, you know, echoing similar comments. So, you know, our sense is that the BOJ is gearing up, possibly for um, a reduction in the uh, the pace of JGB buying as early as the June meeting, which would then potentially set the market up for uh, an actual rate rise at the short end, and maybe as soon as the July meeting, which is what we have in our forecast. If that comes to, to pass, then obviously depending on what's happening at the US yield end of the spectrum, I do, I do think that has the potential. So our dollar yen forecasts, you know, actually have us, you know, down closer to sort of 150 and heading lower, but very much predicated on the Fed is still, you know, for choice is still going to ease this year, and the Bank of Japan may surprise with the rate at which it does um, sort of start to normalise policy. It's hard to see uh, anything going right going forward, at least in the short term, for the yuan, right? But, you know, 
it, it may actually be the right direction for policymakers in terms of boosting exports? Well, that's obviously possible. At the same time, it has been interesting that under a lot of pressure, you know, particularly from dollar yen, they've actually been reasonably resistant to allowing the yuan to weaken. I think there are limits to how much they will allow mm. the Japanese yen to continue to weaken versus the yuan, because obviously that undermines their competitiveness in terms of competition in third markets for exports. But um, at the moment, I think they, they still have a view that strategically they feel that their interests may be best served by demonstrating a commitment to a stable currency, You're thinking about greater internationalization of the currency, you know, creating conditions where we might see foreign direct investment and capital inflows coming back into China. So demonstrating commitment to stability, I think, does suit them in that sense. At the same time, I think there are limits to how much they can resist the lure of a stronger US dollar and a weaker yen. So um, those fixings are going to be very important, I think, in the coming days. We're going to have a budget out of New Zealand in a couple of hours' time. Uh, we've got the Kiwi back above 60, uh, but we do expect to see uh, debts increasing uh, mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the government side. Uh, what's your outlook for the Kiwi dollar from here? Uh, well, again, it's uh, in the context of a broad dollar view, we're actually quite positive on the New Zealand dollar. Uh, we don't think that, um, you know, obviously the hawkish rhetoric that's come out of the RBNZ last week and which surprised people, you know, we're still very uh, reticent to believe that that could actually translate into tighter policy and you know given that the, the, the parlous state of the New Zealand economy it's not obvious that um, you know higher for longer rates or even a rate rise will actually be supportive if it further drives the economy sort of further into the ground um, but the budget today may not be helpful to that cause you know if we do see you know a significant loosening in policy we'll have to distinguish between the sort of cyclical blowout in deficits that's purely a result of very weak economic activity versus any sort of structural easing or sort of fiscal stimulus if you like, uh, fiscal impulse. If there's anything there that suggests that um, you know there is a significant fiscal impulse, uh, then I think maybe the market will move from sort of odds against to odds on as far as a tightening is concerned. Short-term impact of that could be Kiwi positive, uh, but in terms of what it means for the economy going forward, well, I'm less convinced that it would sustain ongoing New Zealand dollar strength. Mm -hmm. All right, Ray Attrell, uh, head of FX Strategy at National Australia Bank. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, Heidi, uh, we do have that budget uh, coming out of New Zealand in about uh, two hours, 20 minutes time. Uh, there will be a lockup underway at the moment. And uh, we are expecting a deficit, $5.7 billion, a longer road to surplus, probably 2028 now. Despite all that, tax cuts. Um, hello, inflation, what's that going to mean? And we just heard Ray saying there he's uh, got uh, short-term upside for the Kiwi dollar. Yeah, it is difficult, right? And you've got this kind of similar situation that a number of developed nations are facing, which is that uh, tension between fiscal and monetary and whether one undermines the other. Uh, and it comes at a time where cost of living pressures are really uh, pressuring a, lo a lot of governments and a lot of um, you know, treasury departments. So these promised task cuts to alleviate the cost of living pressures and low middle income households in particular, even as we see recessionary conditions curbing tax receipts. So um, Finance Minister Willis has said that the package will be fiscally neutral, won't add to inflation. That was your question. It'll be fully funded by savings and new revenue streams. But of course, uh, you know, the in inflationary mindset, I suppose, is always one that's a risk. Yeah, and uh, no return to surplus before the next election either. So more to come on Daybreak Australia. Do stay with us. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> The U.S. has again warned Beijing it will face consequences if Chinese companies continue supplying Russia with components for weapons used to attack Ukraine. Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyemo spoke, us, spoke to us on a visit to Kyiv, repeating that Washington is open to further sanctions. The moon in the capital today is one of urgency in terms of doing everything they can to defend their country. And I've been impressed by the brave men and women here in Ukraine. And the fact that they are committed to fighting for their freedom and doing everything they can to build an economy and to build a free and democratic country. And I'm here because the United States wants to be their partner in doing exactly that. And in addition to talking to them about sanctions, I've been able to talk to them about our economic support and the ways in which we can make sure that the United States and our allies and partners stands with the brave men and women of Ukraine. You said just yesterday on your tour in Kyiv that an unacceptable amount of weapons components are still getting into Russia. There's sir, a sentiment that sanctions are simply not working. As the Treasury's point man on sanctions, does your trip confirm that? 
My trip confirms that we need to do more to make sure that our sanctions continue to stop Russia from being able to get the goods they need to build the weapons that they want. What we know is that the Kremlin has charged their intelligence services with trying to get around our sanctions, and we are concerned that Russia is getting access to key component parts, particularly from China and other countries, that are allowing them to build these weapons. And what, what I'm here to do in Kyiv is to talk to my counterparts about the new tools we're considering to try and go after the ability of the Kremlin to do just that. Fundamentally, mm -hmm. we can't do this alone in the United States. We need to do it with our allies and partners, and that's why I'm heading from here to Germany to give a speech and talk to my German counterparts about the importance of us acting together to stop those components yeah. from getting to Russia. Well, we're looking forward to that speech in Berlin. Will you announce secondary sanctions against those responsible for those components getting into Russian weapons? So I'm not going to preview, preview any actions that we're going to take, but what I will say is that I'm going to talk about the fact that in the United States and our allies and partners are going to be open to sanctioning any company or individuals that provide material support to Russia's military industrialized complex because we want to make sure that Russia doesn't have access to the goods they need to fight the war they want here in Ukraine. U.S. Deputy Treasury Secretary William Yama there speaking to Bloomberg's Joe Matthew. Uh, take a look at how U.S. futures are trading at the moment. This, of course, after all, was another dismal session for Treasuries. Bonds falling and pushing yields towards uh, pretty close to the highest levels of the month. That final auction of the week uh, reinforcing this broader trend of lackluster demand in the market. We had two other uh, weakness, uh, pretty weak sales earlier this week as well. So this trio of summer auctions contributing to what is a broader kind of sour mood, not just across Treasury markets, but other asset classes as well. Uh, we are hearing from the Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic at the moment speaking to uh, in a conversation at a Q&A event saying that inflation, the path to disinflation will be bumpy, but the general trend is down. The path to 2% inflation is not assured and the Fed is vigilant. He's also saying that the job market is tight, but not as tight and closer to February 2020 conditions. The breadth of price gains is still pretty significant. Less inflation breadth would add to the confidence when it comes to a cut. Uh, referring to the fourth quarter, that may be the time when the Fed can reduce rates, saying that uh, there's a need for patience. Consumers are less sensitive to higher rates right now. So more or less in line with uh, the sort of possibility of higher for longer, the need for more evidence, more conviction in the data before the Fed will move really in either direction. You can catch us live and see our past interviews in our interactive TV function, TV Go. You can also dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions that we talk about. Become part of the conversation as well. Send us instant messages during our shows. This is for subscribers only. Do check it out. TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Take a look at some of the latest tech stories that we're following uh, in terms of earnings. HP shares gaining in late trade and reported quarterly revenue that topped analyst estimates, including its first increase in PC sales in two years. Revenue from HP's computer unit increased 3% in the second quarter. That jump was due to a rise in commercial sales, while consumer sales continued to decline. Salesforce shares slumped after the bell as the software maker warned that sales growth in the current quarter would stall to the slowest in history. It sees revenue rising only as much as 8% in the current period. That's fueling concerns about its ability to stay relevant as the industry moves forward towards artificial intelligence tools. That shift also reflected in C3AI's stronger than expected annual sales forecasts. It expects revenue of almost $400 million in 2025, higher than the average estimate of around $360 million. C3AI has been introducing products with generative AI, which can create text and images in response to a user's prompts. And AI, of course, going to be the key focus at a major tech summit getting underway in Singapore. Our very own Annabelle Drewers is there live for us. Belle, what's on the agenda? 
Yeah, well, Paul, it's actually just getting underway this morning here. We've got the ATX Summit coming into its second day, actually, but it bills itself as sort of a major tech event, in fact, a flagship tech event for Asia. Uh, Singapore, we know it's really a city that's pushing to become the Silicon Valley of Asia, and we've seen really a very concerted government push behind that. Even at this event it's itself, for instance, we've heard from Singapore's president. We'll be hearing from the vice prime minister as well later this morning. Uh, certainly, as well, some of the, the attendees at this really reflect that because we've got the likes of IBM, Meta, Anthropic, OpenAI as well. They're all here billed as speakers at the event. Uh, people that I've been speaking to are actually more from the startup community. And this has been really interesting just to understand more about what's the funding landscape looking like right now. And what I'm actually hearing is that it's very, very, very accessible at this point in time, particularly if you have AI attached to your name, even though I'm also hearing calls that perhaps are really in a bubble here and that's just too much hype, maybe a little bit too many promises as well. And uh, lots of great conversations today, Bill. Yeah, that's right. Uh, again, that, that startup focus and, and also these companies that are sort of pre-IPO in that stage as well. One of those is Databricks, and we're going to be speaking with the co-founder actually in the next hour. So this is a cloud-based platform. There's a, a lot of different technicalities to it, but what we understand is that it helps the likes of Shell, Condé Nast, uh, Big Pharma Giants, many, many different customers uh, essentially work and with large data sets and as well build their machine learning models. So that's coming up in the next hour. That company as well last valued at $43 billion. We're going to get an update on those listing plans. The US FCC, you can see there as well, We're going to be talking about that regulatory scrutiny that we see in the US on the likes of major media companies, uh, Netflix, telcos and more, and as well, uh, later on, a, an interview with Singapore's senior minister of state, Paul. All right, Bloomberg's Annabelle Drill is there, live from the Asia Tech Summit in Singapore. All right, these are the stocks we're going to be watching when trade opens in Korea, Japan and Australia at the top of the hour. BHP, of course, in focus after the Aussie miner abandoned its $49 billion bid for Anglo-American. Sony is in talks to acquire Queen's music catalogue. Sources saying the purchase could potentially total $1 billion. And keep an eye on Australian agricultural and elders after Canberra announced that beef exports to China well, they're now set to resume. Asian carry is also in focus after American Airlines cut its profit guidance. Heidi. Yeah, take a look at uh, watching when it comes to commodities. Uh, oil in particular, uh, this is a picture. We are seeing New York crude looking pretty flat at the moment, just under that $80 a barrel level. Pretty steady, retreating on Wednesday, of course, that broader risk off sentiment, really offsetting the heightened tensions that we continue to watch in the Middle East. Uh, all of this before that OPEC plus supply meeting on Sunday. So we do see a bit of a decline. Brent uh, also seeing a bit of steadying there as well, but commodities more broadly following uh, bonds and stocks in the US lower again that disappointing sale of treasury is really reverberating across asset, other asset classes including uh, commodities also watching copper as we see a bit of a breather there that historic squeeze on new york copper futures drawing to a bit of a close and iron ore is one to watch as well uh, seeing a little bit of weakness there but that advance that we saw from the lowest close in more than a week uh, really reflecting some of the optimism on gradual process, uh, progress being made in china's property market and some of the support measures that we're seeing for major cities there. But coming up in the next hour of Daybreak Asia, our exclusive interview with the CEO of Link Asset Management. They manage Hong Kong's first listed real estate investment trust, talking strategy, the portfolio reporting and earnings miss. But in the meantime, the market opens in Sydney, Seoul and Tokyo are next. This is Bloomberg.